So let me introduce Andrew Montalenti, who's the CTO and founder of Parsley, which is a startup doing working with content publishers to provide them analytics and more relevance to reach their audience. And also, let me introduce Keith Bergen. He's the backend lead for Parsley. So they'll be talking about real-time streams and logs on Python. Cool. Can you guys hear me OK? All right. So, um, so yeah, thanks for having us here. This is, uh, I think, our third Pi Data now. We've been at Pi Data out on the East Coast in New York a couple of times before. Uh, we're excited to talk to you about some very new stuff, uh, real-time streams and logs with Apache Storm and Kafka. Um, the agenda of our talk is uh, to cover a little bit about what we do at Parsley and why we use Storm and Kafka in production uh, for our web analytics platform. Uh, talk a little bit about how you can aggregate, aggregate streams of data using Apache Storm and particularly using uh, Python with Apache Storm. Uh, since it's a JVM technology, we've written some code that helps with that. And uh, then Keith will uh, dive into Kafka and explain why it's a good design principle to organize data processing systems around logs. Uh, some quick admin on this talk. Uh, all of the presentations and code that Parsley has given and open sourced are available at parse.ly slash code. So you can go there and you can actually see the project links that we're talking about today, as well as actually the web-based slides that you're looking at right now. So if you're in the back and can't see things, you can pull it up on your browser. We also have a note form of the slides up there, and uh, you can click on that link in order to uh, actually get more detailed info that you can copy paste, like code samples and things like that. So very quickly, what is Parsley? Uh, so Parsley, uh, as the introduction mentioned, is a web analytics platform for digital storytellers. These are some examples of our customers. Uh, we work with large-scale content publishers online, and they send us a lot of data that we use in order to help their journalists, editors, writers, and site managers understand how content is reacting uh, with audiences across the web. We get a lot of high-speed data. Uh, the typical news story, you could imagine, has a very short shelf life, typically less than 48 hours. It's fast-moving. It's minute-by-minute, second-by-second time series data. We get a lot of volume of data. Uh, thousands of posts per day are published by our content publishers, and uh, we've been tracking millions of posts across the web in this way. And some different kinds of data that we play with in our platform include time series, summary data that might do aggregates and grouping by different categories, uh, ranked data, and these are all screenshots from our dashboard that I'm just flying through. Uh, so ranked data that might group content by different tags or topics. Uh, benchmark data that might compare how the certain content has performed relative to the past. Uh, and then, in general, we kind of refer to information radiators that bring all this data together, real-time streams, historical streams, and uh, showcase basically how content is moving on their websites. So how did the architecture of Parsley evolve over time? Uh, well, we started like almost every distributed system engineering team with a basic queues and workers architecture. So how many people here have built a queues and workers architecture? Like almost everyone here, right? So like most people, we started with tools that are well-worn and understood, like RabbitMQ. Um, when we hit scaling issues with those, we moved to more lightweight queuing mechanisms like Redis and ZeroMQ. And with workers, we started with the simplest possible, which is cron jobs that are doing certain you know, things in Python, and then went up from there to something like Celery, which is a pretty nice worker system in Python's community. Um, but what we found is that over time, things started to get pretty complex. And I'm sure you guys have found this too if you've worked on complex or uh, large scale data processing pipelines. You have a lot of workers. They're doing a lot of multi-stage processing. If anything breaks in the chain, you don't really know what happened. You start setting up ad hoc systems that start communicating across a lot of different boundaries. And it becomes difficult to debug what data actually ended up in your database and where that data actually came from in terms of its provenance starting in the queue. Uh, and also, you just have lots of moving parts. So this is an actual diagram I drew a couple years ago when I was trying to understand the system we had wrought on our servers, right? All of these workers and queues operating on real-time streams of data. And it just gets really messy. Um, and you, you basically start developing ops dashboards and spending most of your time trying to manage systems rather than actually building business logic around the time series data you were collecting in the first place. Uh, 
So Storm is actually a framework that was developed at Backtype, a company acquired by Twitter uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and Storm's now an Apache project. And basically, Storm tries to solve this workers and queues problem by turning it into a framework. So it's a distributed real-time computation system. Uh, you can kind of think of it analogously to uh, Hadoop in the sense that Hadoop gives you all these primitives for working with batch processing, while Storm gives you primitives for working with real-time computation or stream processing, for running long-running processes that are operating on a fast-moving stream of data, rather than, in the case of Hadoop, something where you might run batch processes across like file system uh, data sources. And it's perfect for a replacement for that messy system I just kind of outlined on the last slides. Storm's features are that it's fast. Uh, it can handle millions of tuples per second per node. Um, it's got fault tolerance built in, so it knows when nodes go down or when data isn't processed. And it can actually uh, rescale the, uh, the cluster appropriately in response to those faults. It has parallelism built in, and it's separate from your code. So you don't change your code in order to make your system more parallel. You just change the topology configuration, and your Python code becomes more parallel. Um, it has guaranteed message processing built in, which I'll cover more in a sec. And it has some easy code management and local development features, which we leverage. So the storm primitives that are built into the framework are you typically start your data processing system with a streaming data set. And actually, we use Kafka for this. And almost everyone who uses Storm in production also uses Kafka for this. So we're going to cover Kafka in the second half of the talk, explain like why that's a good tool for that. But typically, you start with some streaming data. Then 0MQ is used under the hood for IPC. And bolts and spouts are the core abstraction in Storm. A spout is basically a process that generates a stream of data. And a bolt is a process that actually works with that stream of data and does some transformation on it. Um, and that topology is laid out in a directed acyclic graph. And that graph is basically your entire worker and queue system uh, as like a model of multi-stage processing. Then there are some ops parts of Storm, like the Nimbus and workers, which manage execution. And then, like I said, you can tune the parallelism and get fault tolerance for free. Uh, so a wired topology might look like this, where on the left you have the uh, Storm uh, spout that's generating data. And then you might have several storm bolts. In this case, the directed graph is starting with two bolts where the data splits out, and then a third bolt that's receiving data from one of the two earlier bolts. And all of this is modeled in the topology. Storm also has a notion of a tuple tree. And what that means is that it understands the source of every piece of data that's moving through your system, so that if a node goes offline in the middle of processing some piece of data, Storm knows where that data originated from and is able to replay the original tuple into your topology to reprocess that data. So in this example, we start with a sentence. Uh, that sentence might move through some bolts that do word splitting. And then those words might actually be counted. And the final tuple is a word and the current count for that word. And the issue here is that Storm can efficiently know that if a bolt, while it was trying to count the word, uh, cow, for example, falls over, that actually it needs to replay the sentence where that word came from, as well as any of the other sentences that might have contributed to that count. And it's able to do that very efficiently. So I'm going to show you a couple of code examples now. And then I'm actually going to jump into the command line to show you the project that we built that makes deploying storm topologies really easy with Python. Um, but I'm going to breeze through the code first, and then I'll show it to you from the terminal. So basically. The two things you need to do in order to use Storm is that you need to write your logic using uh, some integration library. We've built one that's called StreamParse, which we're going to show you today. Um, and then you have to actually describe the layout of your topology in a domain-specific language that's built for that purpose. In this case, the language we're using is one that's bundled with Storm, which is called the Clojure DSL. Uh, it's written in Java's Clojure, like Lisp-like programming language, but you don't really have to know much about Clojure in order to use it. Essentially, you can see that it looks kind of like a Python dictionary. And it's basically saying, uh, I have a spout that's called a word spout. And that spout corresponds to a file called words.py. And on the last line of this definition is actually saying it emits one tuple, and that, or it emits a tuple with one field. And that field is called word, right? So that's all this is basically saying. Um, if I implement that spout in Python, it looks something like this. And, uh, and basically, in this toy example here, I'm just going to emit 
uh, I just create like an infinite stream of words like dog, cat, zebra, and elephant. I just emit those infinitely, and that's going to be my stream of word data that I'm going to be counting. Because I guess no big data example would be complete without a word count example, right? So the, uh, the word count bolt is only slightly more complicated. You basically tell the bolt where it's getting its data. In this case, that's actually the, uh, the word spout that's over here, right? And then you actually tell it, OK, this is the implementation of my bolt. These are the two fields that I'm outputting. And then here's something interesting. I say P2. And what this means is I tell the topology definition, I want my bolt to run with a process parallelism of two. So have two Python processes that are inputting data from the spout. Um, and that's hinted here. And then the word counter is really simple. It just maintains an in-memory counter from the collections API. And uh, it just counts every word. And at the, at the very end, it does two things. It emits the current count for the word. And it also logs it using St Storm's logging infrastructure. Uh, so I'm actually going to now jump into the terminal and show this stuff to you. Um, so let's see if this works. Uh, yeah. So far, so bad. OK, there we go. So. Can you guys read this all right? Yeah? OK, cool. So, uh, so StreamParse is a project that we just open sourced today, actually, um, that uh, provides you with a command line utility called sParse. And sParse lets you quick start a project which knows how to run storm topologies. Uh, and it'll also let you run that storm topology from the command line very quickly. So traditionally, when people tried to play with storm with Python, they kind of got turned off because you have to download like all these Java dependencies and get this cluster running on your machine, and it's a big pain. But with uh, sParse, it's actually really easy. So you pip install stream parse, which is the, the uh, library in Python, and then basically you get this command, and this command says sParse quick start, sParse run, and then a few other subcommands. If I say sparse quick start and I create a directory called pydata, what happens is it actually went ahead and created a bunch of files that follow a, a directory template that we have for how storm uh, topologies in Java could be laid, or sorry, storm topologies in Python could be laid out. And this actually relies on a tool under the hood called Linegan, which is like a closure build tool, but it's kind of abstracted from you, so you don't really have to know about it, although that is a dependency for using stream parse. It's only one line of code to install Linegan. It's like either a curl one-liner or you, know, you could use Homebrew and install it, and there's also apt packages available. Uh, but once you get that running, you can basically create this topology, uh, this word count example in the PyData directory, and then I can run sparse run, sparse run, and uh, it'll actually start running this word count example from the command line. What you see in the bottom right here is uh, I'm just running a process monitor that's showing that Java has actually spun up. And that's because the storm infrastructure is spinning up a local cluster right now. It's actually also compiling my topology, which was defined in that domain-specific language before. And now that it's actually running, you'll see some Python processes running on the right. And so you'll actually see that word count, because its parallelism is two, is running with two Python processes. But then words was running with one. And, uh, and that's really nice. That kind of shows you uh, kind of the whole infrastructure running at the command line. And that's really all you need to do to do local testing. So as another kind of cool example, I created uh, just a slight variation of this project where in addition to storing the, uh, or sorry, in addition to having a basic quick started project, I modified the, uh, the bolt so that it actually uh, stored data in Redis. So now, basically, instead of a counter, I'm just connecting to Redis, and then I'm incrementing, I'm doing something like z incur by in Redis uh, to increment the word count. And if I run this guy here, uh, let's just do sparse run again. Now in the bottom left, I'm actually going to see the live word counts uh, for this topology. And so you can actually see that it's counting words really quickly. They're refreshing in that screen. That's just a Python one-liner that's calling Redis and asking for the sorted keys, right? And then the, the topology went back down. And so run this again, and the same thing happens. So what's really cool about StreamParse is not only does it let you get Storm started really quickly and test these topologies locally, but it also sets up a structure where you can organize your Python code and 
uh, deploy it to remote clusters. And actually what my team's working on right now is making it really easy to do things like manage virtual ends on multiple storm machines that are running in production, which we have some code at Parsley that does that already. Uh, so yeah, so that's basically stream parse. You can find it online at the same link as before. Uh, so let me see here. Let's pull that back up. Cool. And now I'm going to hand it over to Keith, who's going to talk about organizing around logs. So. Cool. Thank you, Andrew. Yep. So and everyone, I assume, can hear me OK. So I want to talk about organizing around logs. And the second half of the talk is about Kafka. But one of the more important things is sort of a shift in the way that we've come to look at the data that we process at Parsley. So the question is, what do I mean by logs? You know, and I'm not talking about things you'll send to Logstash looking for you know, warnings about database queries that are slow or system status messages. But what I'm really talking about is a series of time-stamped facts about a given system. So you know, the, the example that we do, you know, most of our processing is based off of web logs that we get. You know, we're an analytics company. We get similar pixel data to Google Analytics or Omniture or whoever. So we have a stream of data coming in that's it's fundamentally a log, but it's also raw data that needs to be processed. And as this goes through a pipeline, it eventually, you know, it gets partially enriched or various stages through the pipeline to the point where it turns into database operations. And depending on how you write this out, you could look at this as a series of logs to be processed. So when I say logs and when I say a log-oriented architecture, this is really what I'm talking about. So the motivation for this, um, if anyone has built a significantly sized distributed system, this looks painfully familiar. Um, to those who haven't, it might not look so bad. What happens is you start with one system, and then two systems need to talk. So those two systems get hooked together. Then you need a monitoring system. So that gets connected to the monitoring system. And eventually, you end up at this lattice slash spaghetti mess, uh, the diagram taken from LinkedIn where every system needs to talk to every other system for various reasons. So when you organize around a unified log, what you have is you have a way for everyone to talk to each other. You have a basic clearinghouse for all the information that needs to be distributed around your data center. So you take the old diagram and you make it much, much simpler. So now everyone who needs to know about the status of your system, about what's going on, merely needs to basically tail dash F the log. So that's obviously not practical to run 37 tail processes on each machine, but you use a queuing system or another system, um, <coughs> excuse me, to manage as a clearinghouse for that data. So needless to say, as I mentioned earlier, we are most decidedly a log-centric organization. Um, we were not built with that idea explicitly. It just sort of fell out of the problem domain that we solve for. Um, and ironically, in this diagram, the log is not central to the diagram, but it's most certainly central to our data processing. Um, you can see it as the second one down on the left. So, and it was Andrew that actually came up with this insight that when you start thinking about our data and how we work with it in terms of logs, all of our databases, be it our real-time database, our archival database, the data isn't, that is not the canonical source of data. The only canonical source of data we actually have are the raw web logs. And as long as we have those archived, everything else is functionally a materialized view on that information. And once you realize that, it's actually kind of a freeing concept because you don't have to worry about losing an analysis because it can always be rematerialized from you know, your base materials. So the question, of course, is, what magical, amazing system could possibly handle all this data? Because as you grow, you know, scaling is always a problem. Um, and this is where Apache Kafka came in. So it is, it's from LinkedIn. It's a log-centric messaging system. Um, it's designed for incredibly efficient resource usage. Now, it solves a very specific problem, and it sits in a very specific area. Because it's not quite a messaging system. It's not quite a pub subsystem. And it's not quite a log aggregator like Flume or Scribe. It basically does all three of them. Um, and it does them in, in a really interesting way with some architectural trade-offs. But what it's able to do is it's able to get really kind of incredible throughput. Um, for us personally, we run it on three really small machines in AWS. Uh, but it's able to handle the only bottleneck we have is network throughput. So when we need more network throughput, we add new machines. But in terms of disk, in terms of memory, you know, it's serving up tens of thousands of messages per second with virtually no load on our machines. 
So, and also for note, um, I guess 0.8 is not a new release at this point, but it's also able to have full replication of data um, and your, your data as it goes through uh, as of 0.8. So to go over some quick concepts of Kafka, uh, you have a cluster, you have brokers within the cluster. This is a familiar architecture. Um, it ends up feeling a little bit like Cassandra where you have a ring architecture where uh, the topics themselves are distributed among uh, the, um, are distributed among the brokers based on various rules you set in terms of replication. So within each broker, we have a topic. And the topic is, it's like a pub sub topic. It's what you produce to, it's what you consume to. And for the sake of replication, it actually takes that topic, which is organized like a log file, and breaks it into partitions. So your topic might be named raw data, but it'll also have, say, 10 partitions that make their way around the rest of the cluster. So producer is pretty straightforward, produces messages. Consumer groups, you can actually organize your consumers so that you distribute the reading among several machines so that uh, it's guaranteed that each message only reaches a consumer once. So for handy distribution, fault tolerance, and parallelization. Uh, offsets I will get to in just a moment. But first, what's the catch, right? It sounds strange, new, magical, wonderful. It's all of those things. Um, but you know, as adherents of the CAP theorem, um, consistently, consistency and availability are great. Uh, it does have some issues with network partitioning, but as long as it's in the same data center, those are generally negligible. Um, the one large architectural trade-off that it makes, which is a huge break from traditional messaging systems, is that there is no out-of-order acknowledgement um, of messages. So, and this is what I mean by the offset on this slide, to go back. So, Kafka does not store message state on a message per message basis. Instead, what it does, true to its core as essentially a distributed log, is you store your offset within that log. So as a consumer, I know that I've read up to message 407. So I mark that as a mark. I don't know if I processed 406, 405. If there was one missed in there, there's no way to functionally store that within Kafka. So what it means is that it is, again, to go back to the analogy of tail-f on a log file, it's very similar to that. On a restart, you're going to know where to pick up within that file, because it is disk-backed, and it's going to keep the, um, the data around for a while. So you know where to restart, but if there are little bits of missing information behind there, you're not necessarily going to know that. Uh, this sounds like a really big problem. This sounds like a huge deficiency compared to traditional messaging systems. In practice, with a couple clever solutions around batching uh, and a little bit of care, it's actually proven to really not be a problem for us, at least, with the kinds of problems that we solve. So again, to go over Kafka as the idea of a distributed log. It's because of how the partitions work. Um, you have a log file split into evenly sized pieces. The consumers read offsets into that log. Um, to get into one technical detail, the offsets are stored on a partition basis. So you wouldn't say I've read up to message 146 on x partition, it's, or x topic, it's x topic, y partition. But messages can be replayed because it's all disk backed. Um, and logs are maintained for a configurable period of time. Uh, and consumers share identical logs easily. So this is something that, compared to a lot of systems, um, is a huge difference. So if you're using Redis's pub sub feature, it needs to keep track of every consumer it's blasting messages out to. If you're using RabbitMQ, for every consumer, it stores message state for every message and every consumer. So you know whether it's read, whether it's acknowledged, failed, retrying, and all that. Kafka is a pull-based system. So in fact, prior to uh, 0.8.1, it didn't actually store those offsets. You were responsible for storing those offsets in Zookeeper, or the client was. Um, so really, when you make a request from a Kafka topic, you're requesting X messages from a certain, uh, from a certain topic slash partition. It's entirely pull-based. So what this does is this actually reduces the load of what the Kafka server needs to keep track of, and it's able to parallelize to a number of consumers with exceptionally small overhead. There's no duplication of messages. There's no duplication of state. Um, Zookeeper or whoever might need to store more offsets, but those are generally integers and easily stored. So to revisit the idea of queuing problems, I alluded to this in the previous slide, um, RabbitMQ and Redis have serious shortcomings when dealing with very high volume traffic. 
So you can scale a RabbitMQ cluster up to the size that we need, but it would take maybe an order of magnitude or two more hardware than we use right now. Uh, and it's largely because of these architectural trade-offs like uh, out-of-order acknowledgments. You know, random disk access is very, very slow. And especially when you're talking about spinning disks, to have to go back and mark messages as acknowledged, as failed, ends up putting a huge amount of load on the system. So, and again, really the big thing is that more consumers not leading to more server load ends up in terms of scaling being huge. It means that you can add new consumers for your data without ever really having to worry about it. You know, so if you have a new monitoring system or you have whatever. So this brings us back around to the earlier bit about Storm and why the two are such a good fit together. You know, and over the evolution of Storm, there have been various messaging systems that are in vogue, like Kestrel or Starling. Um, people have used Redis for messaging. But by and large, Kafka is very popular in the Storm ecosystem today. Um, Andrew, when he was talking about the tuple trees and the retrying, so Storm's basic guarantee is at least once processing for every tuple, um, not exactly once. And there is ongoing work in the community via a project called Trident <coughs> to bring guaranteed once processing. But in general, it provides at least once guarantees. So this really fits in with Kafka's lack of out of order acknowledgments. Since you don't have a strong guarantee on the consuming system, the producing system doesn't need the same strong guarantee. Um, and needless to say, if you have a system that's able to produce millions of, or that's able to process millions of tuples per second, it would be awfully nice to have a queue system that could serve millions of tuples per second. Um, and the other thing that has come in really handy for us is that when you have a high performance messaging system that you can basically throw anything you want at it without really having to worry, um, you can do all sorts of interesting tricks. So the one thing we use it for are basically relief valves within our pipeline. So let's say one of our database machines is sick, <clears throat> you know, either it went down or whatever, and our write throughput is suffering. We have, a, we, have a, um, we have a Kafka log right in front of that, right before it gets written, so that it doesn't shut down our entire pipeline when that one area has a problem. You know, you're able to basically handle the back pressure from that, make sure that it doesn't knock over systems further down the pipeline, um, and generally keep the real-time processing system happy and healthy. You know, we're in news analytics, we deal with very spiky data, um, and it's really nice to be able to handle it in a sane manner without dying. So this, unfortunately, I don't have anything nearly as fancy as Andrew to show, uh, but there are two current Python drivers for Kafka, one for 0.8, one for 0.7. Um, the reason I bring up the two, given that 0.7 is a bit older, uh, is that this one currently does not support the fancy distributed consumer stuff I was talking about, where they share partitions. Um, this one's much simpler for 0.8, called Kafka Python. This one for 0.7, which is the one we use and the one we maintain, has the enhanced consumer, which it uses Zookeeper, um, for coordination between nodes. And if anyone wants to come up afterwards, I can go into the details about it. Um, but that's why I bring up the two drivers. Uh, it's worth noting, depending on what you need. There's no real need in the community for two drivers. So hopefully, as we migrate as a company to 0.8, uh, we'll be able to merge the two communities and keep things reasonable. Um, needless to say, this whole log-centric thing is not necessarily our idea. Uh, a lot of other companies are involved, you know, have the same way of thinking about the data that they process. Um, most notably, uh, LinkedIn had a great blog post on log centric architectures. They created Kafka. Twitter, of course, as Andrew mentioned, uh, bought Backtype, which created Storm. So, in conclusion, what we've learned. Um, it goes without saying that there's no silver bullet in data processing technology. Uh, for me, I think having a high throughput messaging system has changed the way I think about a lot of problems, but it doesn't necessarily solve all of them. It just makes life a lot easier. Uh, you know, the other nice thing about log-centric log architecture is that disk space is really, really cheap. So if you think about that as your principal data store, you know, you're not as worried about, as long as you can make it queryable in the end, um, it's not as much of a focus on the memory heavy systems. So timestamp facts in their rawest form are a great source of data. Storm and Kafka both let you develop on top of them. So we have a fair bit of time left. Um, are there any questions? 
I don't know if we have a mic going around. So I've been, we're a company that's pretty heavily invested on AWS and it sounds like you guys are as well. Mm -hmm. So why would I choose Kafka over something like Kinesis, which seems like it fulfills very, the requirements are almost exactly, and the limitations sound like they're almost exactly the same, except I don't have all the overhead and the complexity of like a zookeeper setup and that sort of stuff. Is there something that Kafka gives me that Kinesis doesn't? So it ends up being a similar question to why do I roll Postgres instead of Redshift? Um, it's usually a question of cost. Uh, in terms of features, I personally haven't investigated Kinesis yeah, as much as I should so, have. So Kinesis <coughs> actually uh, basically imitated the Kafka API and was coming out around the same time that Kafka was getting popular. So like Keith said, it's a question of do you want to lock yourself into you know, the Amazon infrastructure or do you want to run open source software on your own hardware or your own virtual machines? That's really all it comes down to. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I think they both scratch the same itch. I don't know exactly in the weeds like what Kinesis has that Kafka doesn't. I haven't done like that analysis, but I know that they're very kind of similar uh, philosophically. You know, yeah. Um, one of the things that's really nice about Trident is that you basically specify your topology in, in a very functional way, um, and, and then it sort of computes the physical execution plan for you. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have any plans for stream parts to do something like that with your closure definitions or, or no? So we've started looking into it. Um, there's a JIRA ticket open on Storm to get multi-lang support for Trident. Uh, barring that, we can't really do a whole lot. Uh, because, you know, it's very heavily tied to the, the JVM and all that. Um, but that's certainly, you know, as we, as we work on stream parts, that's definitely something we're going to be looking into. Because it really does seem like Trident is the direction that Storm's moving for pretty much everything. Keith, can you yes. talk a little bit about uh, some of the overhead costs you might incur on switching over from a non-log-based system to a log-based system, and uh, either some of the scales at which it becomes appropriate or some of the strategies you might have used to accomplish that? Uh, certainly. I mean, for us, it was, it was very much changing the way we looked at the problem we had. Uh, we didn't actually make a lot of huge architectural changes when we first started looking at it this way. We're starting to as we move down the road. Um, I think one of the better examples is, you know, we do a lot of web scraping um, and storing logs for that instead of just ephemeral data in a database would be really nice. Um, well, I guess the, the, cost. The, big, the big win you get, I guess, if you're switching, if you're kind of switching mindset, is that you start treating your databases like pure indexes and not like databases. So that also means that if you're evaluating all these newer databases that have different trade-offs, it's very easy for you to basically run two systems in parallel that are both like computing similar views but on different database technologies of your original log data. And um, if you treat your database as like the canonical store, then that might be like a painful schema migration problem. Yeah, so it's much more of a conceptual change than an architectural one for us. Um, so specific changes one would make, you know, as long as you're storing all your raw data in a very raw format, wouldn't be huge. Yeah. In terms of like scale, I guess, I don't know, I, I, I think that it probably comes down to, uh, you know, if you're doing thousands of messages per second and you feel like back pressure on a RabbitMQ instance or uh, overflow on your Redis instance is like imminent, and you're starting to investigate things like how to distribute out Redis using some of the newer stuff that's available, you might you know, be at the right scale where maybe you should look at Kafka instead, right? But if a single RabbitMQ instance is serving your whole plant fine, then that's fine, uh, you know, so. Where, where did you build your uh, message resiliency? It means the fault tolerance if something breaks, uh, during the tr tr transition. So, so, so there are three parts of the question. So that's one part, and I'll put all the three. Um, second is how complex is your logic uh, in the middle tier, which is in at the storm uh, uh, processing, so complex event processing place. Mm -hmm. And then what are the other uh, end persistency model did you use? Was it Hadoop-based or uh, any other uh, database or uh, 
because when I see so many messages coming in the pipeline, you must have uh, interesting implementation for persist the data. So that okay. Three so parts. all right. So to take that from the first part. Um, most of our redundancy for the actual log collection and persistence to Kafka uh, is handled by Kafka itself. Uh, so our data collectors write directly to the Kafka instance, and then we rely on Kafka's replication for the actual persistence and resiliency there. Um, as far as the actual complexity of the storm topologies, you know we have two topologies that run in sequence with a Kafka queue in between. Um, I mean, I don't. I don't know how to evaluate complexity. I mean, I, I built it. I feel it was complex. Um, but that feels like a very subjective evaluation to me. Uh, but as far as the data persistence goes, that was actually a really interesting problem for us. So our principal data store is MongoDB. We really appreciate the queryability. A lot of things work. But write throughput isn't the best in the world. You know, If this was Cassandra, the story would have been a lot simpler. But with MongoDB, we had to worry a lot about overflowing it, um, especially when we were running on smaller instances. We used to swamp them all the time. So this was actually where we put, um, we actually put a Kafka instance right in front of where we write to the database. So it was basically writing out MongoDB's op log to Kafka before it got to Mongo, at which point we could take all those operations and reduce them. So we do a lot, you know, we're an analytics company. We do a lot of adding one and one a lot. Um, so you take all those operations, you reduce them to their most information efficient form, and you end up reducing the number of operations that are actually sent to Mongo. Um, at last count, I think we had 100 to 1 efficiency on that. So we produced you know, 100,000. We ended up only writing 1,000. But you don't, in, in Storm, you don't have the acknowledgment uh, method to tell sender that I have processed the message completely. You do actually. Yeah, you do. Um, you do have. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So yeah. it's part. It's part of both the multi-lang protocol and the the core Storm API that you can acknowledge that a tuple has been processed, or you can fail a tuple, and in that case, it'll replay the tuple from the tuple tree's uh, root if you fail it, no matter where in the topology you fail it. All right. Thank you. Yeah. How is Storm support for breaking down a complex task into subtasks, dependent subtasks, and executing them on the distributed infrastructure? That's a great question. So the question was how Storm support for breaking big tasks into subtasks that you can like kind of work on reasonably, and um, and actually that's one of the big wins we've gotten out of Storm. So for example. Uh, when we do teamwork on data flows like these, we often uh, break up our project by thinking about the inputs and outputs of different bolts inside a storm topology. And we have different engineers working on different bolts and testing them in isolation before wiring them together in a topology. And what's really wonderful about this is that no engineer has to really worry about you know, uh, how it's going to run concurrently in practice. And no individual engineer has to worry about like you know, message acknowledgement and replay and failed, you know, all of this kind of stuff, and not to mention monitoring and all of the rest of it. Um, instead, that code gets tested in isolation, and when you wire a topology together, um, you actually have like a complete data processing pipeline, um, but each component is kind of on its own. So I, I think it actually does really help with teamwork on some of these uh, streaming data problems, uh, kind of is the right level of abstraction for that. All right. Anyone else? Uh, are we nope. all set? There we go. Oh. Hi. Um, <clears throat> uh, with Kafka, what's the um, the mechanism for uh, actually getting data out of your program into the log? Is that uh, is that like socket level? What's the options and what's the performance profile of that? Am I waiting while the write is happening, and so on? So there are a number of ways to do this. Um, it's gotten better with the 0.8 release. Uh, what they do is they implement, they implement their own binary TCP protocol. Um, so it's not HTTP REST or any of that, uh, which ends up giving you a little bit more efficiency uh, at the expense of you know, driver writers like myself have to implement a binary interface. Um, there are a bunch of things in terms of bursting communication. So one of the big things when you're writing out say, lines in a web log, they're very small. 
Um, and it results in a lot of small transmissions, which are remarkably inefficient over TCP. So there are, in a properly invented driver, uh, batching mechanisms so that you're sending fewer, larger messages to the Kafka broker. Uh, it does the same thing on the back end when sending messages back. Uh, so in general, throughput we've seen, I mean, we do, and again, we run, by all measures, a, a pretty small cluster. Uh, it handles, I think, 20,000 messages per second. Uh, which for us translates to, I think it's 75 megabits in about 160 megabits out. So, and that's not, I mean, those machines are really underloaded. So we've been, we've actually been ramping up how much we use Kafka because we have so much, we're so over provisioned. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I understand that you, you're downsampling before you store in MongoDB. Mm -hmm. Would it make sense for you if there were a use case where you wanted to preserve all of the logs intact to dump them into something like Elasticsearch so you could then preserve the entire uh, data? So we actually do keep all the logs. We store them in S3 and Amazon S3, and then we use traditional Hadoop tooling to do batch processing over the logs. So you know, part of the log-centric infrastructure is that the log data comes in, it gets backed up right away so we can rebuild from it at any moment, but then the live stream of data moves through the storm processing plant and real-time computation happens from there. Um, and yeah, you're right that you know, technologies like Elasticsearch, uh, I don't think in, we've actually played with Elasticsearch and it wouldn't really work to send all of our logs into Elasticsearch, or at least we'd have to run a really massive Elasticsearch cluster to make that happen. But you could do a little aggregation and then put data in a source like that and it would work pretty well. Yeah. All right, let's give a round of applause to Andrew and Keith. By the way, feel free.